That's great. Good. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ellison. I appreciate that. We're in a series on the apostles, and we're just going to look over a few things uh, about Andrew today. The 12 elite original apostles were pretty ordinary people that did some pretty incredible things. Already, it's a quick lesson for us. It was um, Henry Blackaby, I think he was in the 90s, in his great little book, Experiencing God, made that statement, anybody in the hands of God can do what God can do. Well, that's really true of these ordinary 12, and today we're looking at Andrew. Anyone in here, either first name or middle name, Andrew? Let me see. Be proud. Serious? There's no Andrews in the room? Okay. Okay, let's see. Uh, How many of you know an Andrew? Oh, see, it's a very popular name. It's extremely popular, as, as you can tell. (laughs) <laughs> Last week was Peter. Do we have any Peters in the room? Seriously? I've never had a, this is This is the most pagan group of people I've ever seen in my life. This is unbelievable. Well, you have a pastor whose name is Rob, which means steals things. So, I mean, there's the meaning of the word Rob, but we probably have Robs in the room, but no Peters or Andrews. Ross, do you remember when, um, when Emma in high school, her and her best friend, um, you do know what I'm talking about already. Yes, they were going to homecoming, and they said, we have these two great kids that we're going homecoming with, and we're like, oh, that's awesome. They said, they're the nicest Hispanic kids you'll ever meet, and we're in northern Arizona, it's great, and I'm like, I'm like, okay, do we know them? Like, and she goes, no, we have no idea who they are. But what's the worst that can happen? One was named Angel, and the other was named Jesus. (laughs) Honestly, I mean, I'm like, I'm in. You have Jesus and Angel taking our kids out to, and it was true. They really were. They were, it was, it was, um, it was prophetic. They were the nicest two kids you'll ever want to meet. But Andrew, if you want to rename a kid or something, this is a good choice of names. Andrew uh, actually means like manly or brave, courageous. That's what Andrew means. Andrew was a, was a fascinating character for us to look at because he started out first. Protoclete, protocletus, proto first. Clete is called. He was the first called. But then it shifted. It shifted pretty quick, and he became kind of at the bottom of the list in some ways, but didn't seem to care. Because Andrew is known for having deep waters. This level of commitment. So when you think brave and courageous, almost think uh, also very well constrained, very strong but strong for the right reasons. See, the Bible refers to life with remarkable words. The Bible refers to life as being swift as a runner, like a mist. That's how life is referred to. And guys, gals, we get our mind on something and we pursue it and pursue it, and before we know it, life's done. That was it. That's all you got. Were you pursuing what you really thought you needed to pursue? Were you pursuing the right thing? I don't know yet if there's anybody on their deathbed that said his last words, if I just made more money. Well, as trite as that may sound, that's important for us to have end of life, not only to see what people say, but look at what they don't say. And then spin this back to where we are today, and we're living a life today, pursuing things, literally costing us our health because we're pursuing something so much. We're risking things. We're risking family. We're risking 
to accomplish something without stopping to think, am I pursuing the right thing? Does it matter? And that's why Andrew is so great for us because we can see these deep waters and where it led him into the accomplishment of who Andrew is. Before we look at, we're looking at like one or two passages only. Before we do, let me pray and commit this to the Lord. Heavenly Father, in a beautiful setting right now, I'm asking that you would help us Look at what our priorities are. If we're pursuing the things that we should be pursuing, and help us maybe to model ourselves a bit after Andrew, in Jesus' name, amen. John chapter 1, if you have a Bible there, John 1.35 is the introduction to Andrew. Andrew's mentioned 13 times in the New Testament. This was the start. Andrew was actually a follower of John the Baptist. That's where he started off and then switched. So if you look at John chapter 1, verse 35, it says, The next day again, John, this is John the Baptist, was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Well, Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and you'll see. And they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him for a day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said, we found the Messiah, which means Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which means Peter. A couple things that happen right there, 12 of those elite apostles, actually only one of them had their name changed. And it's right there. It was, it was Simon. Simon, his name meant to hear. In an unbelievably bold and authoritative move, Jesus meets the guy, changes his name, foresees his future. Remember that was last week when we said you need to speak positively into the life of somebody, not necessarily for who they currently are, but who they're going to be. And the power of those words when we keep saying to somebody, you're wrong and you keep doing things wrong, you're not going to amount, it becomes prophetic. Jesus saw Simon and goes, oh yeah, well, it's for now on the rock. And he's probably like, what? That, that, seriously? Like, this doesn't make any sense. And then it, even through failure after failure with Jesus, Jesus kept it going, going, no, no, you will live up to this. Well, Andrew's name didn't change. None of the others did. Two of them had nickname. Mention that later. Beyond his call, he really received very little attention, 13 times. He seemed to be content with it. But what was interesting about him with his personality was he's known to have brought individuals to Jesus. That was his shtick. Because out of 13 times, three occasions, he brought a person. So think of it this way. His brother, Peter, he fishes with nets. Andrew, he fished with a pole. Andrew was that kind of a guy. You had Peter on the one side who was fiery. You never know what he's going to say or what he's going to do. Andrew, his brother, slow simmer, constant, faithful, very different personalities. Let me tell you what the, um, a couple of the instances 
Andrew starts off, he's the first. In fact, uh, Gene gets his great little book called, uh, I think it's called The Twelve, points out that he was really the first twice. He was the first follower. He was also the first called of the elite as two different instances. That was interesting to me. You can look at that on your own if that's interesting. So he's really the first twice. Then the first thing he does is bring Peter along. And then forever, the four listings of the apostles, Peter, the one he brought, He becomes the first named on all of them. Andrew's the second one named. Typical brother, right? Took over after him. He's like, bro, you would have have known nothing if not for me, and now you're taking the overall spot. Ah, that's okay. No, it gets worse. Because how many we all know, do we know that there was an inner circle of Jesus? Who was the inner circle? Peter, James, and John. I always say Peter, Paul, and Mary, but that, those came along like in the 60s. They were amazing. I loved those three. That was a different circle. But as far as the elite 12, it was. It was Peter, James, and John. This isn't just a listing. This is literally in the Garden of Gethsemane when all the elite 12 are there, Jesus leaves them except for the three and goes further, Peter, James, and John. It wasn't the only instance. The transfiguration, all the apostles left behind except for Peter, James, and John. In fact, there's a miracle where Jesus raises a dead a girl to life in an enclosed area, and the only ones allowed in? Well, we'll say it this way, not Andrew. (laughs) He got relegated down pretty quickly. He didn't care. And if there's a lesson for us at work, in our families, at school, absolutely a sports team, if your focus is attention, If the focus is appreciation and value that people place on you for what you do, you're going to be really disappointed. In fact, if you and I desire that kind of attention, it will never be enough, ever, because it's an impossibility to have everybody. It's not enough. Andrew showed early on that it didn't make any difference to him at all. There is no sign whatsoever that he cared. In fact, after the resurrection of Jesus, when they all got split up and off they go into ultimate being killed, you know who Andrew went off with? Who did he get paired up with? Matthias. The one who took Judas's place. It literally was second string. (laughs) That that was his famous, those two, off they went and killed. Andrew didn't care. And for us, it's hard to not miss appreciation and to miss being highlighted and shown that you're amazing. It's hard to ignore that if you don't have a higher goal or purpose. A sports team. If your goal really is, I want the best team, I'm going to be the best teammate, and I'm going to fulfill my role, if that's really the goal, you don't care who gets attention. Am I right? Isn't that the perfect athlete on your team? The one that says, put me in, don't put me in. Coach, your coach, whatever you want, I'm behind it. If my name's not on the banner, it's okay. It's true in life. Andrew was really focused. Andrew had a focus about him. It's the second point in your notes, just kind of running through these. Of those 13 times he's mentioned, three times he's mentioned as having brought somebody. First one was Peter. That wasn't a bad catch, right? That was pretty good. Got Peter. But there were two more. Two more that are mentioned that he specifically took care of. 
The one is in John 6. So if you're in John 1, you could just flip over to it. There's a little bit more behind the story, a story that you know. It was the feeding of the 5,000. Verse 3, Jesus went up on the mountain, sat down with the disciples. It was Passover. Uh, the end of verse 5, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? That's Philip. He said this to test them. Verse 7, Philip said, 200 denarii worth of bread isn't enough to feed these people. Then one of the disciples, the it, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, Andrew goes, yeah, because that's what I'm known as. It says, Andrew is the one that said, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Well, that's interesting. Out of the masses, Andrew's the one. How did he know that? You read old his, from old history to more current, just simply allow this text to breathe and to look at this. They weren't huddled together. They were mixing. They were out. They were meeting people. They were organizing and Andrew knew this kid? Yeah, it actually fits with his personality. Peter would never have seen the kid. Peter wouldn't have a clue there was a kid with a lunchbox. Andrew? Yeah, that kind of fits. Because, oh, you know what? I've got a kid. Hey, hey, buddy. Hey, buddy. We were just goofing around here. Show him your lunch. He didn't have a lot of faith. He goes, it's not going to be much good, but we have this. Not much good, but I at least have it. In John 12. Then look at John 12. Another pass, third one, on Andrew. Now, among those who went up to worship the feast were some Greeks. These came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Okay, already off to a bad start because he, Jesus was with the Jewish people, so we have Greeks showing up, and they go to Philip. Philip's a Greek name. That was on purpose. Like, is there any room for us? We sure would like to meet him. Goes to Philip, good choice, Greek name, and what does Philip do? Philip solves the problem. Philip went and told Andrew also a Greek name. It's the two of the apostles with Greek names. Went to Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. It was Andrew again. Andrew was about the fishing with a pole, not with a net. He's focused. I'm wondering about many of us. I, I wonder if we think the fishing with nets without realizing the influence that you and I have individually, not to promote Abundant Life Baptist Church, not to promote a creed of some sort, but literally to promote the person of Jesus Christ. Think now of this. I'm going to go at a little different angle on this. Thirteen mentions of Andrew in the Gospels three of them where he's bringing an individual person to Jesus. All three of those were in the Gospel of John. Yeah, it's the Gospel that he says, I have written these things, very pointed. John was clear. I am telling you all of this for one I'm telling you all this so that you would believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. That's why we're talking John wasn't given a biography. John just wasn't telling stories. John was literally pointed, I want people to know Jesus. And he brings out, no one else did, he brings out the three instances where Andrew did it. That's us. Listen, I can't change the world, but I can see somebody come to know Christ. 
I grew up and I had a huge youth department of which I participated in as a high school kid. And it was great, 120 students, it was fun. And I remember we were having an activity one night and I went to the public high school and I remember uh, a buddy of mine, Scott, uh, lock her over. He goes, what are you doing this weekend? And I'm like, oh, we're uh, doing something with the church. And he goes, oh, that sounds good. I said, yep, all right. Like, whatever, see you later. And he goes, whoa, 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 what are you guys going to do? Now I'm annoyed. That's how oblivious I was to this whole thing. And I went, um, I don't know, I think they're, they're renting this racquetball facility like almost all night long. I mean, it's going to be a ton of fun. Like, see ya. He goes, well, any chance I could go? And I'm like, oh, you're killing me, Scott. Like, you're going to ruin my vibe. Like, this is crazy. I went, okay, you can go. It wasn't too, this guy, completely non-churched, non-Jesus background as you could possibly imagine. He came to know the Lord within two weeks. He became, he's grown up now, kids. He's a leader in his church. He was the best man in our wedding. Was he my best man? He was? Okay, same thing. I'm like, really? What's your name again? He goes, Scott, I'm the one that you took to that event. Really? That was you? One person. No, play that out. That's one high school kid, married, kids know the Lord. Their kids know the Lord. One person. Kid in my, my locker, next to my locker. That I would have missed if he weren't persistent. He's not even a persistent guy. He's the most laid back That's Andrew, one person. Could you imagine if we all led someone to Christ, watched them disciple and grow? And yet the truth of the matter is most Christians have never led anyone to Christ. Oh, we'll, we'll love the evangelistic crusade stuff, in fact, most would even want to criticize them. It's horrible discipleship. No, they're at least doing it, right? I mean, at least they're doing something. I was trained in evangelism explosion. Remember the old televangelist D. James Kennedy? I was really fortunate <clears throat> to have time alone with him. And it was one time, it's so funny. It's just a funny story he would always tell. People would say to him, um, I don't like the way you do evangelism because criticism of his method or something, right? And he was great. He goes, well, I like the way I do evangelism better than the way you don't. <laughs> right? He's not the problem. The problem is that we don't have the deep waters. Apparently, we don't see the value of somebody coming to know Christ. We have families broken, being broken. We have kids without loving parents. We have kids being abused. We see the, the chaos. The answer is not a church. The answer is not a creed or a system of belief. It's an actual person who loves us all so much that he gave his life for us. He's alive. It's like real. It's a relationship, an intimate, passionate relationship with Jesus Christ, who's our Savior. That, isn't that the answer? And yet we hold it in, and Andrew's like, no, 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 no. He's a sleeper. I'll tell you, he's a, he's a slow simmer. But there he was. That's why when you think of his personality, if you would envelop in your mind all that we know of Andrew, you could picture him working the crowd and going over to a little kid. The little kid didn't just show up to him and say, I have a lunch. No, he knew it because he's been hanging with the little kid. And Peter, the first thing Andrew did when he became a follower of Jesus was go get somebody to bring with him. Man, there's Andrew. Remarkable. There's a Welsh evangelist by the name of Peter Joshua. He preached a lot at the Moody Bible Church in Chicago back in the day. This is what happened to Peter Joshua. Early in his life, he was an unemployed actor, 
He slept in alleys at night and accepted handouts throughout the day. And one evening in London's Hyde Park, he saw a Salvation Army girl stand up to read poetry. Wanting to give her a little bit of support, he literally became her only audience. Instead of reading, she began to sing. It was a song about the worthlessness of this world as compared to the glory of Jesus. This is Peter Joshua himself telling the story. She then quoted a few Bible verses and then turned and awkwardly walked away. Right then, he received Christ. He later said, I sure wish today that those 70,000 converts, which he has seen in his revivals, if only this little girl who's still unnamed would only know what happened to her faithfulness. Isn't that awesome? The mark of success. Third point, I'll just do it really quick. Bring up a, a photo here, it's a painting. It's a painting of, uh, of Andrew. It's, it, there's some typical things about it. One is the um, saltire, the X cross. That's the St. Andrew's cross. That's how he was uh, killed. He was executed on the X cross because he said he didn't want to be, same as Peter, right? Peter upside down, didn't want to be crucified like Jesus, put me upside down. Andrew, put me on an X cross, and that's a painting of Andrew. There's a couple things about it. It's five feet tall. It's the, the real painting. In fact, if you go online, there's a lot going on about that painting. Uh, Legal-wise, it was stolen during the Holocaust, and it's wanting to be returned, and there's all sorts of stuff going on with this painting. But what's noticed is, and you can't really see it on the screen, that blue-green in the background, along with his composure, brings a calm contentment because he had those still waters. Even though he's leaning against this X, which becomes, in fact, him and Matthias killed at the same time. This is what we also know as St. Andrew's Cross, right? That's the, the salt tire is on the Confederate flag. It's the Scottish flag. It's the Russian Navy. And the list goes on and on and on. Kind of like in here, how popular the name Andrew was. Right? Right? It is, because we all know of an Andrew. Somewhere, somehow. The St. Andrew's cross really is that common and that popular, and it is a tribute to him. But what's you notice if it's if you have a good photo, a good rendition of this, his hands are very rough. As he's holding a book as he often is, and the book is always attributed to the same thing, the book is attributed to be the gospel. And there he is, elderly, the soft curves in his garment, the composure, yet leaning against the cross. That's Andrew. Andrew had a immovable spirit about him. You could really look at that for a while. Back in the day, and this, the painting, keep that painting up, the painting's 600 years old or so, or 500 years old. It used to be when everyone's illiterate, the Bible's taught through paintings. That's why. How many of you have been to the Vatican? Most unbelievable, right? It, and people, what a waste of money. No, it was because it was trying to convey the story of Jesus in the most spectacular way to people who can't read. And so the painters were actually, they're actually theologians teaching. They're trying to teach us things. So if you look at the paintings or the mosaics, the frescoes in, in the, uh, the Vatican are just unbelievable, impossible to make and to 
are all conveying something. We have being conveyed to us a beautiful picture of Andrew that I admire and I want. I want to be that comfortable and confident in what I'm doing. Like, set your course right. What if it leads to, what, being overlooked? (laughs) Do you think that guy cares? He's leaning against the cross of which, prophetically, he was going to be executed on. It was in the background of that's, but that's Andrew. Didn't care because he's that determined. Oh, to be that determined. I want to tell you, there are people today, and many of you, a single parent, you're, call, you're raising kids alone, and there is no time for you to be sick. You get home from work not to relax. You get home to work to work. It's exhausting. And you've decided, you're like, you know what, this is what I'm about. And nobody applauds the single mom or the single dad at the end of the day and says, you did a great job today. There's no applauding. You've accepted your task, your calling. God will bless you for that. And at work and a sports team, all of those fit. But then ultimately, what is your calling from God? What are you called to do? Well, we're all called for the basics love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness. We're all called to that, regardless if we get attention. Called to promote Christ. Whether it means we're made fun of, mocked, it doesn't matter because we, our waters run deep like Andrew. Let me pray with me right now. Bow in prayer. Heads bowed. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, this is where it all begins. It's the message. Faith in Him who died for you. And for the rest of us, and Heavenly Father, I'm turning to you as we all in our hearts and online, we're all praying to you and we're saying, we want to have these deep waters. We want to be that simmer, to be so confident in our lives that no matter what happens, we know that you're pleased. Bless us, our efforts, in Jesus' name, amen.